Welcome back. We are on part two of our learning module for behaviorism. In the first part, we talked about how behaviorism was a school of thought in psychology that was following in the tradition of positivism. And that theme will be seen also throughout uh, the second part here. We've got a first look at one person's version of behaviorism, looking at J.B. Watson's notions. And we're going to talk about three more researchers, Tolman, Hull, and Skinner. Each of them had their own versions of behaviorism. And it's important to uh, recognize that the school of behaviorism had different varieties, different goals, and different people took it in different directions. So it wasn't completely monolithic. Before we head into Tolman, what I want to do is uh, make two general points. First of all, just admit some general misconceptions that I was carrying around ever since I learned about behaviorism. And two, I want to make a kind of general comment about the connection between behaviorism and cognition. So as a first point, I personally had some misconceptions about behaviorism. And maybe you've heard about behaviorism before too, and perhaps I've heard similar things that I did. For example, Maybe I got this out of a textbook or something, but I've heard of behaviorism as described in as the dark ages of psychology, that time period in American psychology where no one was allowed to talk about cognition. And another way I've heard about that is in terms of this kind of black box picture that I've drawn here. The behaviorists were apparently only interested in um, measuring objective things such as the stimulus that's out there in the world and the responses that are made to a stimulus. And those things are out there in the world too. Those things are both things that are measurable objectively. The, the stuff that happens in between, for example, if an animal or a human sees a stimulus and then does some internal processing, makes a response, all of that happens inside of a black box and no one's allowed to go inside the black box and say what's happening in there. I've heard this as a kind of characterization of the themes of behaviorism. Now, uh, those are probably massive oversimplifications. In my view, uh, and we will see that behaviorism was a school of psychology that, although it criticized things like introspective psychology, it accomplished many goals that paved the way for modern cognitive sciences. So I think uh, rather than being a, a blockage or stopping cognition from cognition research from occurring, it did a lot to shape how modern cognitive research is conducted. Okay, so with that, we will head into Tolman's behaviorism. So let's talk about Tolman. Here he is. He was an early cognitive behaviorist. And I put cognitive in quotes because Tolman was a researcher and uh, who made arguments to the research community that cognitive terms should be included in a science of behaviorism. He also spent a lot of time studying maze learning abilities in rats. So we will cover both of these aspects. First of all, Tolman made an argument in favor of a molar definition of behavior. And this is an important conceptual step in the, in the school of behaviorist thought. So if we're thinking about the early 1900s, behaviorist researchers were attempting to carve out research space between mentalistic psychology on one hand and physical sciences or physiological research on the other hand. We learned in the last mini lecture, people like J.B. Watson criticized introspection as a subjective method that was non-scientific. I don't think anyone was criticizing physiologists for being non-scientific. 
because it was, you know, it's possible to use a microscope or something and me objectively measure things like cells and blood vessels and neurons and things like that. The behaviorists were somewhere in between. They were attempting to legitimize in the eyes of themselves and in their conception of science that studying human and animal behavior could be done uh, objectively in this positive tradition. Now, when I'm talking about human and animal behavior, what am I talking about? It could be really anything. So here's a list of behaviors that Tolman puts together. A rat running a maze, a cat getting out of a puzzle box, someone driving home, home to dinner, a pupil marking a mental test sheet, a psychologist reciting a list of nonsense syllables, my friend and I telling one another our thoughts and feelings. So for him, all of these things are behaviors. All of those things are fairly complicated also. Um, if you're trying to, like, how would we describe any one of those things? What Tolman suggests is that uh, these kinds of things should be described with a molar definition. And this allows whole behaviors to be things in and of themselves that can be studied irrespective of their molecular units. What does that mean? Uh, here's a, another quote from Tolman where he starts to unpack these ideas. And let me read it. Behavior has distinctive properties all its own. These are to be identified and described irrespective of whatever muscular, glandular, or neural processes underlie them and these new properties, distinctive of molar behavior, are presumably strictly correlated with, and if you will, dependent upon physiological motions, but descriptively, they are other than these motions. Down here, after he describes a whole bunch of different kinds of human and animal behaviors, just to illustrate the wide variety and complexity of, of things he wants to call behaviors, he suggests that, look, I can label those things. I can call them what they are. Other people will understand what I'm referring to. Like there's a person reading a book. We can all go and look and say, yep, that person's reading a book. That is using regular language to describe the behavior. And in, in this part of the quote, he goes on to say that, look, we can mention those things and also admit that we have no idea about the molecular properties of that behavior. So for example, we don't know what exact muscles and glands and sensory nerves and motor nerves are involved while a person is doing a behavior such as reading a book. And he will argue that in order to study the behavior of reading a book or other behaviors, for him, he doesn't necessarily need to know what all those uh, underlying physical processes are that are occurring in order to make some progress in describing, for example, categories of behavior or maybe even principles of behavior. So if we were to go out there and start measuring what animals do in different situations or what peoples do, people do in different situations, we're going to see lots of different actions. We'll be able to describe them. Maybe we could predict and classify these kinds of behaviors without uh, requiring a full description of all of the component parts that go into the organization of um, those humans and animals. And by that, I'm talking about the biological processes, the chemical processes, and the physical processes. Now, Holman, in his early career, wasn't particularly interested in understanding how um, cognition works, but he was interested in using descriptive terms to refer to uh, goal-oriented or cognitive-oriented behaviors. So he argued that even though behaviorists 
were sometimes uh, casting dispersions upon cognition. He thought that cognitive terms would be really useful for behaviorists in order to be able to describe the goals, purposes, and aspects of behavior. So for example, let's say you saw an animal running around looking for something to eat. It could be useful to say the animal is hungry and searching for something to eat and even making decisions about where to look. And this would not imply anything uh, about what's going on in the black box of the animal, so to speak. But the words we are using would be helpful in uh, describing the actual uh, uh, behavior. That's what he argued for early in his career. And later on, actually, he sort of made a change and he started considering actual cognitive processes and how they might work. And this all came out of research in maze running. So let's jump into the research and make some connections. Tolman created many mazes and investigated how rats learn to navigate the maze to find food reward at the end. Here's an example maze and there would be a starting point. The animal goes in there they can run around. There's these blinds to prevent them. You can change all these things, but they'll run around and eventually if they can figure out how to get here, that's the food box. And in the food box, there's going to be a little food reward for them. So what we're about to see is examples of how Tolman used maze running to make inferences and claims about aspects of animal behavior and animal cognition. First of all, Tolman, uh, well, in, in the slides, the first thing we'll talk about is evidence for purposive behavior. I'm not sure if I said that right. Evidence for goal-driven behavior or goal-oriented behavior in rats. Here's what he did. First of all, he manipulated the level of hunger and whether or not rats received food reward at the end of a maze. Okay. He's got these different groups of rats. You can see that displayed in this graph here. So we've got some rats that were not very hungry. We've got some ones that were probably not given food for a while. So they were really hungry. And all of these animals, they got to run through a maze. And some of them, the, for example, this group here, non-reward, this one non-reward, when they got to the food box, there was nothing in there. And other animals, they were given a reward at the end. So when they got to the food box, they, they got some food. Um, here's the result. The hungry reward group learned the maze the fastest over many days. Let's go back and look at this graph again. So what are we looking at? We have days on the bottom, one, two, three, all the way to 17. And it's saying error curves for four groups, 36 rats. And we've got error scores here. So what is an error score? Well, if we go back to this maze, and let me just use my uh, mouse cursor. So you've got a, a, a rat in here, and it's running through, and it can make all sorts of turns or wrong turns. So for example, that if I'm right here and I make a left turn, that's a wrong turn. That's an error. Or I could make a right turn here. That's an error. So there's lots of um, errors that an animal could make navigating the maze. The researchers on day one put all these animals in one of the mazes. And then for each one, they counted how many errors were made. So every day, the animals would be put in the maze again. And look what happens. So we have these curves. And what's happening to these uh, lines is they're mostly going down. So they start off making a lot of errors. And over time, 
they start learning how to make fewer wrong turns. This group in particular, look, the Hungry Reward Group, they got right down to the bottom by day 17, almost to the very bottom. So they're making very few errors. That means that animal gets in the maze, they make all the correct turns and they get that food very quickly. Here's a little point to make. It seems that the group of animals that was hungry when they get in the maze and who received food reward at the end of the maze were the most motivated to learn how to get through that maze with the fewest errors. All these other groups either weren't hungry or weren't rewarded. And they don't uh, really learn as much over, over time. So the inference that Tolman makes is that the hungry reward group had more purpose. And that purpose drove them to learn the maze more efficiently. Let's move on to a different maze. And this is one that Tolman argues provides evidence for cognitive behavior. And uh, one definition for cognitive behavior here was, you know, the capacity to ev make uh, decisions. So evaluate the costs and benefits of doing one thing or doing another thing. Here's a maze. Check this one out. It has many options to get from the start to the finish. Here's the start. And it, if you know the game Plinko, it kind of looks like that. There's just all these gates and you could go all like, oh, you could just keep going like this and then get to the food. Or you could go up the side like this and go all the way like that. So there's all sorts of paths you could take to get from the starting box to the food box. Hope you can see that some of these paths are longer than others. If I go straight up and then across, that's, that's probably the longest way to get there. And if I try to go in the most direct route, it might be something like that. So some ways are less efficient. You have to expend more energy as an animal and other ways are more efficient. You can get there quicker. What happens if you put a rat in this maze and let them get some practice running through it? Will they just go around randomly? Will they take the longest route? Will they learn to find the shortest path? What happened was the rats learned to take the shortest paths. And an inference here was that rats were showing adaptive optimization of their behavior. And so Tolman would use evidence like this to say, hey, we need to describe animal behavior in at least using cognitive descriptors. Here's another example showing that rats have the ability to make discriminations between different temporal intervals. The maze is this square one here. E is the starting point, and you could go around to the right side or the left side, and F is where the food would be. Now we've got two chambers in the middle labeled D, and Tolman detained these rats in the left or right chamber for long or short periods of time. So for example, if you were a rat in this experiment, you would start here. And if you decided to go to the left, some blinds would come down and these little, little lines represent in the maze, you would block that area off. So the rat is just in there and it could be delayed in there for a very long period of time. If, they went to the other side, they could be delayed in that same kind of general location on the right side, but delayed for a shorter amount of time. After the delay, the things are removed, and then the rat can continue on to find the food. So what would happen if, after you've given this kind of training, 
Sometimes you get delayed for a long time, sometimes you get delayed for a short time, depending on which area you, you go. What if after that, when you navigate the maze, uh, nobody blocks you, nobody tries to detain you, you're just free to go, you're free to choose, I'm going to go left or right. And the finding here is that the rats take the shorter route to the food. The what that is the the one where it's not the shortest uh, physical distance here. It's the one that in their previous training had the shortest temporal delay. So this suggests that rats can discriminate between temporal intervals and use this information to guide their navigation decisions. Here we have a paper from 1948. It's a, a well-known classic now. It's published in Psych Review. It's called Cognitive Maps in Rats and Men. It's by Tolman. It's a very long review of a lot of his prior maze running research that he did. And this marks a turning point. So we're in 1948. Previously, Tolman was suggesting that we could use terms like cognition and goals just as descriptive labels for what animals appear to be doing. However, by this point, he is starting to consider that uh, it, we might be able to go into this, quote, black box and start thinking about what the processes are going on in there. This is another way of saying, let's seriously consider uh, that animals and people have cognitive processes and mental representations. He develops the idea that people and animals have mental maps of their environments and that they use these maps in navigating their surroundings. So this is a shift from a behaviorist away from using cognitive terms to talking about cognitive realities. And yeah, so you're imagining when the when the rat runs through a maze, it might actually have a little map of the maze somehow as a as a cognitive map. And it might re consult the cognitive map in their head as it's running around to help them make decisions like, oh, maybe they have a memory for the decisions they made bef before. So uh, let's see, here we have an example called latent learning. And here, this design provides some evidence in favor of the mental map idea. Let's take a look. Group one, we've got three groups of uh, rats. Group one always gets food at the end of a maze. And group two and three, they don't get any food until a specific day marked by the X. So here's some data. What we're looking at is what we were talking about before. So animals on their first day of, of running some maze they've never seen before, they make errors in terms of making wrong turns. And what happens if you just let these animals run that maze? First of all, group one, that's the solid line. That group is getting a food reward at the end of the maze. When the animal gets to the end, they get rewarded. And that line starts up high and it goes down. Every day they get, uh, they make fewer and fewer errors as they run the maze. Pretty neat. Look at group two, it's the dotted lines. On day three, on day one, two, and three, this group of rats was put into the maze and they ran around, but there was no food anywhere. So, uh, they were just running around this maze, basically. Notice they didn't start making fewer errors, really. However, where the X is, at that moment in their training, so after day three, when they got to the food box at the end of the maze, there was food placed there and every day afterwards. And as soon as that happened, look what happened on their performance. It drops really, it really drops down. 
The dashed line is something similar. So this is group three, or sorry, group two here. And for many days up until day seven, this group of rats received no food reward. They're just allowed to run around the maze. And the number of errors they make, it goes down a little bit, but it doesn't really go down that much. At this point, where the X is, that's when they were rewarded with food at the end. And what happens? Errors drop right to the floor, almost immediately. The suggestion here is that, for example, we can clearly see it with the dashed line group, group two. When the animals were not getting a food reward, they were still running around the maze and learning about what it looks like. They were learning the map of the maze potentially. So they may have uh, built a mental map of what the whole maze looked like. On this day, as soon as they know where the food's going to be, they can get, go there very quickly because they already have a mental map of the maze. So the result is that group two and three did not learn quickly until they started receiving food and then they learned very quickly. The inference is that group two and three were building a map of the maze and this is called latent learning. And that it could use the knowledge of this mental map to quickly navigate the maze when they were motivated to get there by food. One more slide for Tolman. Now Tolman was conducting his research in the heyday of the eugenics movement and we will continue to see connections between eugenic psychology and behaviorism and even cognitive psychology. So for example, in 1924, another reason Tolman was conducting maze learning ability research was because he was using maze learning ability as a proxy for animal intelligence. And he was also interested in determining whether he could breed rats to do better at maze learning. Uh, so in this, in this work, Tolman reports trying to breed rats to perform better on mazes over generations. And he reports that selective breeding did show differences in maze performance in the first generation, but not in the second generation. His student Ty Tryon uh, repeated similar experiments for about 11 years afterwards um, and found similar results. All right, we'll spend just a few minutes on Hull's behaviorism. Here's Clark Hull. He was an early mathematical psychologist. He attempted to specify descriptive terms for a science of behavior, terms like stimulus and response, and also terms for drives and motivations, and to use math to describe lawful patterns linking terms in the system. This uh, is a goal of the positive, positivist tradition in science. That is to des describe some model system um, using clearly identifiable terms that can be used to point at individual pieces of a system and then be able to, uh, I guess, describe or say what the functional relationships are between the terms This is a mathematical formula that Hull put forward to attempt to describe learning processes. And let me see if I can just quickly describe this. This term, S-E-R, it's called an excitatory potential. And it's the likelihood that an organism would produce a response R to some stimulus S. I mean, you could think about uh, like we were talking about in the last lecture, 
YouTube uh, is trying to figure out what video to show you so that you watch that video a little bit longer than you normally would. And so they might be interested in a, in a term like this, like what's the stimulus? What video could I show you such that the response would be you watch it a little bit longer? And then all the videos they could show you, they, they might want to know E, the likelihood that the desired outcome would occur. And that's going to be, uh, hypothetically, some function of other things. For example, uh, the likelihood of this excitatory potential could be a function of the habit strength. In other words, uh, the likelihood of doing something could be a result of learning from beforehand. Have you done that thing a lot? Did that stimulus uh, evoke the response many times before? If so, you've already got a, a strong habit strength. So if that's a big number, that should make this one a big number. However, your prior learning might not be the only factor. So he's got a D in here. D is drive strength, determined by, for example, hours of deprivation of food or water, etc. This is another way of saying whether I'm going to do something is a result of how much I learn to do it plus how much I want to do it. Both of those things matter. Another aspect in his formula is V, stimulus intensity. So maybe if I hear a bell because I learned I'm going to get food, I'm going to start salivating. That's the H. If I'm really hungry also, so I'll start salivating even more. And if the V, the stimulus intensity, if it's like a really amazing looking something for me to eat, that's going to make my excitatory potential very high. K is incentive. How appealing is the result of the, is the result of the action? Um, so if I want to eat food, that's very appealing and this might further drive it up. So Hull's starting to think about using algebra and systems of equations to use abstract terms that describe things like what we just talked about here and uh, considering how they might be like multiplied together or added up in some systematic way to predict things like the likelihood I, I do something or not. We're not going to go much more into Hull's behaviorism. I wanted to point it out as a foundational aspect for mathematical psychology, the use of math equations and math modeling or computational modeling is widespread in modern cognition. The last version of behaviorism we're going to talk about is Skinner. This is B.F. Skinner, and I've got him down as a radical behaviorist. He's well known for many things including operant conditioning. If you are interested in reading what Skinner has to say, he's got lots of different books and things like that, but in terms of his uh, description of operant conditioning, I'd recommend the 1938 uh, The Behavior of Organisms book. You can read it by clicking here. It's on the Internet Archive. And the introduction of that book nicely describes what Skinner's behaviorism is all about and what his scientific goals were. We're going to try to uh, summarize them right here. So let's go for it. First of all, what is operant conditioning? Skinner distinguishes between two kinds of learning, uh, type S and type R. There's a lot of terminology here. That, that was one thing that he he did a lot of. He tried to come up with his own set of terms uh, for his own descriptive system. So it's kind of hard to remember what they all mean sometimes. Type S is like Pavlovian conditioning. And in this kind of learning, a stimulus response relationship already exists before conditioning. 
And what I mean by that, for example, a food stimulus might already trigger a salivation response. That's just already something that's happening. With type S learning, the conditioning process of, of pairing, say, food with a neutral stimulus like a tone, that transfers control over the response, that is the salivation response, from the unconditioned stimulus, the food, to a new stimulus, a tone. Pavlov, we already talked about Pavlov and Pavlov discovered that. What did the Skinner do? Well, he discovered type R learning, which he calls operant behavior. It's a fancy word for any behavior that animals do somewhat spontaneously. For example, I, I tried to get a video of this, but I couldn't do it. My cat Coco, she'll just be standing there and she'll just be not really doing anything, but she does this one thing with her paws sometimes. She'll just go almost like, and she'll just walk away. It's not clear that she saw anything. Sometimes she wakes up and then just goes like this. That little paw wiggle, that could be an operant behavior. It's just a behavior that she does. She does it sometimes spontaneously. It's not clear what the stimulus is that caused her to do that. It's a behavior. So type R learning for Skinner involves gaining stimulus control over these kinds of behaviors so that some stimuli will cause the behavior to occur with regularity. For example, I have no idea when Coco is going to do that paw thing, and I have no idea how to make her do that paw thing. Can I somehow train Coco to do the paw thing in response to a particular stimulus? I don't know. According to Skinner, he probably could, because he figured out lots of ways to do this kind of thing. And the way he did that was with lever pressing. So we're going to talk about Skinner's experimental setup. He placed rats in boxes equipped with a lever. Here's an example of a Skinner box. It's got a few things in it. It's got space for an animal to go inside. It's got a food tray, some water, and it's got this lever here. You could, an animal could go in there and whack that thing. All right. Now, Skinner observed that rats will spontaneously hit that lever. You put a rat in that box and there's some random probability that it's just going to go up there and whack that thing at some point. And then later it'll do it again. So lever pressing is an example of a single operant behavior of the rat. What Skinner was interested in doing was developing methods to systematically predict and control lever pressing behavior in the Skinner box. It's really interesting to, I'll say this again, to go back and read the, that book that I referred to because he tells a really uh, impressive story about how science can make progress by, uh, that is behaviorist science, can make progress by um, isolating a particular behavior such as lever pressing in a rat, which is just, you know, it's just a kind of a random behavior to start with. But it's simple enough. And Skinner thought, let's start with a simple model of a behavior. And let's try to describe everything we can about that behavior try to predict everything we can and try to control everything we can. So if we could do that with one behavior like lever pressing in a rat, maybe what we learn there can be generalized to more complicated behaviors in rats and other animals and potentially even humans. So here is how simple, uh, sorry, simple operant conditioning would go. I've got a nice picture of this. A rat goes into the Skinner box. And what we're going to look at here 
is the number of lever press responses that are made over time. So we're starting at right here is zero time. So that's when the rat goes in there. And we can see that for this is a graph for one, one animal. At five minutes in, that's the first time where the animal just randomly goes over and hits that lever, right? And then look what happens. No pressing occurs uh, for almost a whole hour. Right around here, the second lever press is made. And then right around here, the third and the fourth. Now, there's one little bit that I've been missing and it's in yellow. All responses to the lever were reinforced. What that means is that when the, in this case, when simple operant conditioning is occurring, whenever the animal hits the lever, they're getting some water or a food reward, a food pellet or something like that. They hit the lever, they get a reward. So at these moments in time, the first, second, third, and fourth lever press, all of those, the animal got a reward. But also, they didn't start banging that lever right away. It took a while. Whoops. Uh, look what happened after the fourth press, though. This line just shoots up, and I've indicated lots of pressing. And so that means that the number of lever press response is just going up and up and up and up and up. It's almost like a kind of aha moment goes off in the rat. It's like, oh, this thing's giving me rewards. Bam, 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 bam. And they just goes up. Let's talk for a second about interpreting graphs like this. And we have this uh, responses by time in minutes here. I want to just point out two things. First of all, the slope of this line indicates the response rate. When this line is shallow, uh, it means not very many responses are happening over time. And when the line is steep, like the blue one here, that means lots of responses are happening over time. Another thing I'm not sure I mentioned here, this is a cumulative response graph. So we, all, we can always sort of count how uh, the, the position on this line as, as we go across time tells us uh, the sum total of prior responses that have been made. So one of Skinner's goals was to use a simplified situation like this and create a descriptive system capable of predicting and, like, predicting and controlling the, this one behavior. He was able to show many different forms of operant learning that were similar to what Pavlov had shown. For example, here is a graph with Pavlovian conditioning, we talked about acquisition, that's learning the association. Extinction was when, uh, in Pavlovian conditioning, a stimulus would be presented without a reward, and you would unlearn that association. And if you remember, spontaneous recovery was after an association had been extinguished. Sometime later, a stimulus might nevertheless spontaneously elicit uh, some expectation or previous uh, expectation for something that was previously ex extinguished. We talked about how Skinner did acquisition in operant conditioning. He basically put rats in those Skinner boxes, and every time they pressed a lever, they got a reward. And he would make these graphs and talk about uh, these particular kinds of moments in 
in the behavior and use abstract terms. I'm just putting A, B, C, D, E, F, G here to refer to these abstract terms. So for example, during the A moment, the animal is uh, not displaying the operant behavior. They haven't pressed the lever yet. During the B moment, they've pressed the lever a couple times and they're getting reward and the amount of lever pressing is going up and up and up by a little bit. There appears to be a kind of critical moment where, like I was saying, there's this kind of aha moment and that transitions from a, a B type situation to a C type situation where and the lever pressing goes up very quickly because the animals sort of learned that they'll get a reward. If you put an animal in that Skinner box and you continuously reward them every time they press a lever, the rate of responding does eventually decline. You know, the animal might become satiated. They might not want any more food reward. So there'd be a, a D phase in acquisition where that response kind of declines a bit. You could do something like extinction. For example, if an animal was getting rewarded for pressing the lever, you could stop giving them reward for pressing the lever. What happens there is the slope, that is the amount of responses, starts to go down until the animal doesn't press the lever very much. Or in the F phase, this is a flat line, showing that the animal has stopped pressing the lever. So you could try to extinguish the operant behavior from occurring. You might even be able to, and you can also show something like spontaneous recovery where uh, let's say an animal has stopped pressing this lever because they don't get any food. Great. Now you wait a couple days, you put them back in the cage, they just start pressing the lever again. You know, that's spontaneous recovery. And you could describe it using this graph because that would show some increase in the, in the slope here on this cumulative response graph. In many ways, Skinner wasn't particularly interested in lever pressing. He was interested in creating a descriptive system uh, that could account or that could describe functional relationships between terms in his system. Uh, of course, he's applying it to lever pressing, but he's hoping that what he is able to describe in this one limited domain could be abstracted and potentially he could identify laws or empirical regularities and behavior that would apply more broadly. So he talked about things like uh, reflex strength, where a reflex was any operant behavior, and a reflex strength was uh, this notional probability of making that behavior. So a, a not, like maybe Coco's my cat and her little paw movement thing doesn't happen that often, so that probably has a low reflex strength. But if it was something that happened a lot, or if I could somehow train her to do it a lot, then that would have a higher reflex strength. So the concept here is just a word to describe the probability of something happening. Again, in the positivist tradition, a goal of that scientific tradition is to measure things, find regularities in the measurement, and then potentially propose principles or laws that describe those regularities. Skinner was hoping he could do that with something like lever pressing behavior. So he would inspect these graphs that he would make and come up with pseudo laws or principles that describing regularities in his measurements. And he could talk about things like the law of threshold. This is the intensity of the stimulus that the stimulus must reach or exceed uh, in order to elicit a response. Uh, the law of latency, the laws of magnitude of the response, the law of after discharge, and so on. 
also, uh, I guess two, two more things here about Skinner and then we'll wrap up. Uh, he did lots of interesting things. Here's a picture with uh, Skinner working on Project Pigeon, where he trained pigeons to pilot guided missiles. And this is a contraption where you would put a pigeon inside. And the idea was it's got these, these holes, right, where the pigeon could kind of peck at, on, on the different holes. And if you could train a pigeon to start pecking on something, it could uh, direct the trajectory of a missile. If it was embedded at the tip of a missile that was flying somewhere and the pigeon knew what it was looking for by looking through these circles, it could start, if it, if it was trained properly, it could start uh, pecking and guide that missile towards a target. And if you want to learn more about that, go ahead and click on that link. So Skinner was interested in, you know, developing practical or applications of his animal research for all sorts of things like this. And we got the second to last slide. Again, in the general positivist tradition, Skinner wrote a utopia fiction called Wad Walden II. And uh, before I read this, let me just say, at the end of his 1938 book, where he's talking about operant conditioning and lever pressing in rats, which is a very simple behavior, he was fairly optimistic that he would be able to uh, describe, predict, and control that one simple behavior quite well, and that a science of behaviorism could proceed from this one simple behavior, likely to include more complicated behaviors. At the end of his book, he, he, he sort of said, uh, let him extrapolate who will. And I think he was, he had some ideas about what the implications of this work was, but he didn't really spell them out. Later on, I think he did spell them out in this book, Walden II. This is a fictional book. It's a science fiction, but it's when B.F. Skinner describes how behavioral engineering through elaborate operant conditioning could be used to improve the lives of a thousand people living in a commune by ensuring they would live happy, productive, and conflict-free lives. So Skinner really was in that same tradition uh, trying to create a positivist vision of his behavioral science and then he was thinking about how he could apply those principles to engineer society in a desirable way, uh, in, in a way that he thought was desirable. This will continue to be uh, a theme we'll consider throughout the course, the relationship between the research goals in cognition and some of their societal, broader society, potential broader societal implications. So what's next? Complete the quiz for this learning module on Blackboard and or the writing assignments by the due date. And as a reminder, this is the last learning module before the first midterm. After the midterm, we're going to head into the information processing module. This is a period of cognition that uh, follows the behaviorist period. And looking forward to seeing you there.